Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today we will be listening to the 10th part of what if Ruby and Weiss were childhood friends. If you enjoy, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing down below and don't forget to hit that bell icon so you get notified when videos go live. Now, without further ado, let's get into the video. Chapter 19, Nightmare Below Sea Level Penny, where are we at? She asks the orange-haired girl whose eyes were focused on the vast expanse of clouds that was already starting to cause friction with each other, causing some thunder rumbling and lightning strikes. It was a brewing storm, figuratively and literally and all hell's just about to go down once she gets to this bastard's damned base. ETA in 30 minutes, I'll keep the jet hovering around the area but once you guys get in, you have to hurry, I'm not liking the looks of this weather, Penny replies, with a frown on her face, and remember, there's only two of you charging in, avoid any risks at all costs, just get Ruby and the boys and get out of there. I gotta say, for an advanced engineered hunk of steel, it must be pretty bad for you to wanna avoid storms, Nora grins and Penny just rolls her eyes playfully. I'm not worried about the storm hampering the jet, Nora, I'm worried that if we stay here too long, whatever enemy we have will send air missiles to bomb us out of the sky, Penny sighs, also, it's not ideal to fly with hardly any visibility, the waters beneath that ocean is treacherous, there's also wildlife that may pose a threat to your equipment so really, it's in everyone's interest to just hurry up and get out. Well you didn't have to real talk me that hard and fast, sheesh, Nora pulls away and heads for the jet's lobby. Let's have a repeat of the plan, Yang interjects and it was the peach haired girl who answered quickly. Jump off the jet, dive in the shark infested water, go inside the evil underwater base, beat everyone's ass, Save your sister, my love, and a John and get the hell out using any means necessary, Nora says with a confident smirk, this has to be one of my favorite plans yet. I hate how that's basically the summary of it, Yang sighs, anyway, let's gear up, Valkyrie, let's go, commence plan, don't fuck it up or we'll all be dead. With simultaneous nods they got to work. They really had to be thankful that Penny's dad, Pietro Polandina, was a genius who invented waterproof weaponry. They didn't have to worry about their guns being jammed or her arms short-circuiting. Quickly putting on their diving gear over their protective suits and soon her and Nora were ready to jump in the treacherous sea. It was like being in the Little Mermaid, only in reverse and far more horrifying. ETA 10 minutes, they hear Penny from the intercom and soon the jet is heading downwards, lower and lower to stabilize the pressure and make sure they'd be able to safely jump off the plane. From the outside, she sees heavy droplets of rain making its way downwards and suddenly, she hears the sound of waves crashing against each other, Yang couldn't help but gulp. Beaches were fine. They were warm and relaxing. Deep ocean on the other hand? She never was good with dealing with the unknown depths. Seriously, she'd rather be sent on a space mission than go down the deepest trenches of the ocean. Whoa, you're not looking too hot, Xiao Long, Nora says, patting her back and she just shakes her head. I don't deal well with deep waters, Yang replies, trying to even her voice to stop it from shaking. I hear ya, imagine, what kind of monsters lie underneath all that water, crokins. Giant cannibalistic crabs. Thulhu. She couldn't help but wince and look at the girl with an annoyed expression, gee, thanks, I feel a lot better. ETA 3 minutes. The jet slowed down, hovering just a few meters from the water and Yang had to stop herself from shaking too much. Waves rising up so high then crashing down in a powerful impact. She gulps. See you down there, Nora winks before placing the helmet on her head. Then the peach haired girl jumped down head first. It didn't take long for Yang to lose the girl. God damn it, they should have taken the cab marine. Ugh. Why'd it have to be slower than a damn jet? I can do this, for Ruby, she gulps a final time before forming her resolve, big sis is coming to get you. Her screams were drowned out as she plunged into the cold, icy depths. For a good moment, she thought she was dreaming. That this whole thing wasn't really happening. She'd wake up and she'd find herself back in their childhood home, dad cooking in the kitchen, mom playing with her and Ruby. But if that was the case, she never would have known about the truth about their old man Crow and about their other mom, Raven. She'd never have met Blake and Weiss either. She was here because everything that happened brought her to this moment and she'd be damned if she wanted to erase the best people she got to know just because of her fear. Opening her eyes, the first thing she saw was darkness sending a sudden spike of unease before her, her deep, ragged breathing almost making her choke. 
Was she still alive? Was she breathing right? Her spiraling panic ceased when she felt a hand on her shoulder and she saw Nora's face through her helmet, the communications channel blared and she could hear the girl's voice. Whoa, you weren't kidding about being bad with deep waters, Nora says, Man, the sooner we get to somewhere dry, the better, Yang gives a shaky nod and they both swam, following the location showing on their helmet's screen. It didn't take long for them to find the place at all. Just below the water's surface was a giant dome-looking structure made of really strong glass, she presumes and inside was just white. The first thing that came into her mind was a giant laboratory of some kind. Pen, we found it. Be safe you two, there should be a docking area near the bottom side of it, remember, in and out, they hear the orange-haired girl's shaky voice and with a shared look of understanding, Yang and Nora dub down even further into the dark, watery abyss. Alright, so, how on the ever-loving fuck did you two get mixed up in this? Crow Branwen says, with a shake of his head, you two ought to consider yourselves lucky it was us you bumped into. You know these children? The woman from beside him questioned. Yeah. Yang and Ruby's childhood friends, Crow answers and looks them dead in the eye, well. We didn't do this out of our volition, just landed here through a cruel twist of fate, Blake says, posture rigid and tone clipped and nervous. That much is obvious, this is one of the most secure hideouts I've seen in my life, you getting here is pure dumb luck, my next question is how the hell did you get here? The man crossed his arms. There was no other choice, she had to be truthful and there was only one thing left to do. You enrolled Ruby and Yang at our school and by some twist of life we ended up falling back into each other's lives. Weiss began, it was okay for the first two months but when we went out together, we got bumped by this guy wearing a fedora. And she told the pair everything that transpired, taking a few minutes to divulge in the pivotal details that landed them in this place and finally how they ended up here with guns aimed at their backs. And that's what happened. For a good moment the adult pair looked at them with an expression mixed with awe and disbelief, Crow running his hand on his messy, spiky hair and the woman scoffing whilst shaking her head. You two are really lucky to be alive at this point but also very unlucky that you ever found yourselves in this position, what you've done is beyond reckless, the woman lectured them, of all the irresponsible things, this is what you decided to do. Yeah and the fact that it was Yang who warned you, you two should be more terrified about it. Crow follows up, that saying something cause that spitfire is as reckless as they come. We just wanted to help, Weiss mumbled, how did you get here anyway? Was this the mission Ruby once said you were doing? I got captured by the enemy, Crow replies, looking away from the two of them, but Glinda here managed to find me just in the nick of time too, those assholes were tasked to get a shipment of weapons and my fitting was postponed, they were going to place me this, collar or something, controls the mind, you've seen that horde of black fatigue wearing, green eyed slaves, right? We were just about to make our way out until we bumped into you. So you guys have a way out of here? Blake asks, tone almost a plea take us with you, I'm begging. The woman sighs and nods, of course we're taking you with us, did you think we'd just leave two defenseless children here? Hooray for John, Ren, and Nora's mom, Blake says, thank you Mama Glinda. What? The blonde woman blinks at them in clear confusion. Yeah, they told us about you, adoptive mom, right? Strict but surprisingly nice, Blake says and the woman still looked confused, those dumb ass lied again, huh? We'll deal with those idiots later, right now, it's been quiet, Crow interjects, I think they just made a stop here or something, dropped off some goods and took off, if we're even luckier, there'd be a couple of ships that can take us out of here. The four of them sat on the ground and contemplated, forming a semblance of a plan that would be able to aid them. They went with the simplest one. Find where they store the submarines and leave, get rid of anyone who stands in the way. Once they had all agreed, they stood up and stared at the security feeds just above them. It was certainly odd, they all watched some tapes moments prior as the fatigued people head back into their giant warship and leave, leaving this place practically unguarded. That probably explained why the hallways were eerily empty as she and Blake walked earlier. Well, if no one's out there then it'd be easier for us, Crow mumbled, but there's something about this whole thing that's making me jittery, something's not right. Either way, we won't accomplish anything by standing around in here, Besides, we should take every advantage we can get, Glinda says, kneeling down and flipping the bodies over, checking their carcasses for anything they could use, finally, the woman manages to grab a sleek looking black blade Dwekaisashi from the dead body's holster and she tosses it to Blake, 
we can't always guarantee your safety, you two are already here and you need something to protect yourselves with, she also managed to grab what seemed to be a submachine gun from the another dead person and also gives it to Blake, a Beretta PMS 12S. Her friend gulps and looks at her nervously before placing the weapons on her person. The short sword on her lower back was placed sideways for easy access. I don't know how to shoot a gun, Y says quickly and nervously, so, but Crow tosses her a rifle that was slung over one of the enemy's torsos, an M16 assault rifle and some small round balls with a weird contraption settled on top. Here, you don't need to aim much with these but they pack a punch, just make sure to duck and cover all right. Wouldn't want you to lose a couple of limbs or your life yet. Crow smirks before turning around. Pack a punch, are these bombs, she hissed, pushing them away but Crow just chuckles. Yeah, see that thing up top, press it down for about 5 seconds before you toss it and run, yeah. Are you three ready? Glinda speaks up and all Weiss wanted to do was to furiously deny it. Beside her, Blake was more or less feeling the same thing. Next time we're planning an impromptu vacation, we're going with my thing, Blake huffs and heads out of the room all nervous but geared up. Weiss gulps and soon the four of them were making their way to the docking area. Unbeknownst to them, a pair of agents had just washed aboard, being captured clearly by the cameras. She wanted to kiss the floor of the docks the moment they got inside. It took very little effort to be able to get inside, they just needed to open a hatch below and close it again. Once they were in, all they needed to do was press this button that said to press your eyes and drain. They began floating above before the water started to pour out back to the ocean. Making them land on the platform and laying down for a good moment to catch their breaths. She hears a hiss and a thack as Nora removes her helmet and takes a deep breath, I get why you're terrified of the ocean now. Doing the same and sitting back up, she nods as she detaches the helmet from her head, yeah, tell me about it, unzipping the wetsuit that carried them here, soon she was left wearing just their uniform, now, I'm good, let's go. Are you two alright, they hear from the earpieces as soon as they put it on. We're good pen, Nora replies. Alright then, also, if you have the time, check if there's any ports I can jack into, might be able to help you navigate the place. Will do, Penny, Yang answers back, shall we, Valkyrie? We shall, Xiao Long. They jogged through the place with an even rhythm but the whole time they were doing so, she couldn't help but feel something eyeing her from behind. Like she was being stalked by a predator and she didn't like it one bit. The hallways looked plain and monotonous, nothing but white walls and white tiles and bright white lights. As they hit an intersection there were three pathways they could choose, a turn to right, left and to keep moving forward. Fuck, no ports here either, she mumbled under her breath, we're gonna have to continue blindly. Split up. Nora asks nervously but Yang just shakes her head. No, we can't, there's only two of us, if we get jumped we're dead. But where are we supposed to go? Nora asks, eyeing the seemingly endless halls of white, also, don't you think about how weird this place feels, it's empty but I can feel someone staring at me. You noticed it too. Yang says with a more panicked look on her face. Charging her gauntlets up so they were ready to explode on someone anytime. She gulps but focuses on the task at hand, she inspects the passages again and she thought she briefly saw a pair of bloodshot eyes staring at her from the center passage but as quickly as a blink, it was gone. Let's take the left passage, she says, pushing back the creepy feeling bubbling up inside of her. Wordlessly, the pair continued on their mission. Hallway upon hallway they found themselves in, the foreboding feeling only intensified. There was something here that they weren't seeing. Something they shouldn't see at all. Fuck, this place doesn't end. Yang cussed, running a hand through hair, should we go back? But as they were about to turn around, the lights from where they came from were closed. Nothing but dark hallways. Now they could confirm something bad really was happening. Their panic only fully set in when they heard something akin to growl or an angry gargle emanating from the once lit halls. Yang and Nora picked up their speed the moment the lights shut down, darkness inching closer to them, their jogs became a full sprint. What the actual fuck? Yang screamed as she looked back to find a tall, hulking silhouette chasing after them. I thought this was supposed to be a mission. Not underwater resident fucking evil. Nora screams back and the pair did their best to lose, whatever it was. Chasing them. A various assortment of cusses rang in her head like a chant, actually, not just her head. 
her mouth was also in tandem with the repetitive string of fucks coming out of it. Fuck, shit, fuck, shit, fuck, shit, Yang said. Too busy being scared, panicked, and then some. The pair didn't bother checking the corner they were turning, they crashed into a group of bodies, throwing both parties backwards with a surprising amount of force. Her breathing was hard but she immediately jumped to her feet, left arm gauntlet fully charged and one hand hovering over her holster where her pistol was secured. Tears immediately welled up in her eyes when she found herself staring at her old man. It seems like Crow had the same look of surprise and relief, kiddo, was all Crow said before Yang tackled him with a strong hug. Uncle Crow, she laughed and she felt his arms hug her back just as tightly, and you're with, the words died in her mouth when the three women behind him. Glinda was already being hugged by an eager Nora and, she looks at the remaining pair with exasperation. Blake and Weiss were looking at everything but them, feet shifting awkwardly with similarly guilty expressions on their faces. Yang only sighs, pulling back from her uncle's hug. Readying herself to tell them both off for this absolutely, stupidly dangerous situation they put themselves in. But before she could do that, she remembered one crucial part of this whole meetup before them. The reason they even managed to crash into the group of four. Wait. If you're here, where's Ruby? Crow asked and that was the last thing one of them said before the place's PA system blared like a tacky school bell followed up by a robotic voice. Ding dong bing bong attention, there has been a problem detected within the power supply, emergency power mode now commencing. All the lights simultaneously shut down and she felt Uncle Crow pushing her backwards. Yang, where's Ruby, he whispers and she shakes her head. They took her, we used the molar tracker, we found out she's here, they have her crow, replies, sounding almost defeated. The lights came back on but it wasn't the big ceiling lights above, just small red light bulbs on the sides of the hallway floors, barely enough to illuminate anything in front of them. Hold on, I have a flashlight, Blake whispers, pulling out her phone from her pocket and turning on the light. The sudden brightness made her wince but when her vision adjusted, she noticed the direction where her family was looking. She heard Weiss choke back a gasp and she could see how shaky Blake's hands were as she pointed the light towards, something that should never exist. Seven attached fleshy and mismatched arms grafted on its wide back. Uncountable scars littering its torso covered up by patches of skin both from humans and not. Legs like trunks covered by deep flesh wounds. On its waist was a belt made of feet sewed directly on its skin. Its face was almost covered by long, dark hair but the bloodshot eyes and wide manic grin was enough to make anyone quiver in fear. A seven foot tall nightmare fuel, growling at them, saliva dribbling down its chin. Its breathing ragged, almost heaving but it didn't take a single step closer towards them. Then a voice started talking in the speakers. Why hello, agents, I see you've met my pet, an old, definitely senile and decrepit voice said, now, see, an old man like me starved for entertainment, yes. Now, I have a solution for this. Let's play a game, if you can kill my engineered menace, I will give you what you seek but, if you don't, I'll gladly be grafting you to Tyrion here, yes. Oh, by the way, say hi to them for me, I'll be getting your punishments later, you really thought messing with the power was going to help you. Pa, he screams and they hear the sounds of someone getting badly beaten up for a good few hits before the old man comes back, hello, hello, so, anything to say to you too. That only made their fear be doubled as John and Ren spoke up, heaving and groaning in pain. Leave. Guys. They got Ruby. John screams full of raw emotion, just go. We'll find another way out, Ung, Ren says breathing heavily, clearly heavily injured, don't play into his games. But their friend couldn't say anything anymore as the audio goes back to the old man. Now, shall we, he clears his throat, tear it and be a deer and fight them to the lobby, bring them to me dead or alive and if they try to escape to the ships, rip their spines out of their bodies, we'll be making you a new secret agent brand sash tonight. Chapter 20, Opposite Sides Trigger warning for blood, gore, violence, carnage, and trauma. Please do whatever is necessary for you to be safe. There were six of them. The lights vaguely flickering in the distance but most of what she could focus on were the small, red lights on the sides of the halls and the guttural growling of something just a few meters behind them. Urgent, heavy stomps, racing after them and all Yang could think about was that she'd rather take a hundred missions about some sort of crime syndicate, mob, mafia, anything. Anything was better than being chased by this horror, under the ocean, inside an evil fucking lab. 
shit, 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 shit. Crow screamed just behind her, followed up by multiple shots fired by his pistol. Holy crap, this guy's relentless. Nora screams back just as they were about to make a turn around a who knows how many intersections they've passed through at this point, there was another figure on the end of the left, darkened hallway. Only this time, it wasn't a disgustingly malformed abomination, this figure seemed more like a human. Tall, but wore the exact same all black fatigues as the other controlled freaks, head covered almost entirely except for those unsettling, neon green eyes. He moved his hand toward his belt, revealing a row of syringes with dubious looking liquid inside them and he immediately grabs one, stabs it in his neck and injects it straight to his bloodstream. Oh fuck other way, other way. Crow yelled, hand gripping Yang's shoulder so tightly as he made them all run the other direction. Weiss nearly tripped but Yang had managed to grab the girl just as quickly, tossing her over her shoulder like a sack of potatoes as they ran for their lives. The white haired girl could only yelp but did not offer any other words of protest. Nora did the same to Blake and as Yang focused, she could only hear the girl breathing much too loudly to be considered normal. Honestly, not at all surprising, they weren't used to all this physical activities, things that involve nearly getting killed and stuff. What the hell, Crow? Glinda screeches but her uncle doesn't even let up, urging them to run even faster through the opposite direction of where the monsters were. That's the guy who fucking hit me like a battering ram. Crow explains, we gotta watch out. The other two might be here too. What other two? Glinda's question was ignored as they were met with a door that looked like a vault. Crow immediately calls them, Nora. Yang. They hurriedly placed the two civilians down, Glinda grabbing both and hiding them behind a wall as they quickly adhered to her uncle's behest. She charged her right gauntlet to its maximum capacity, Nora doing the same with her warhammer. Sharing a brief glance at each other and simultaneous nods, Yang's arm shoots out, metal connecting against metal at the same time Nora's hammer hits the door. A loud bang and crash was heard, dust and debris covering their vision but Crow only urged them forward. What lay on the other side was the center of the underwater dome laboratory. Unlike the seemingly never-ending maze of white walls and dim lights, the center was filled with glass that clearly showed the dark waters of the outside. You could see some marine life swimming all around and the turbulent deep waters of the outside. Then the lights erupted, they looked in horror as they stared at a stage that was situated at the front of the dome. Suspended in the air were John and Ren, badly beaten, hanged by their arms and legs, unconscious. She sees Nora's composure break and Uncle Crow had to stop her from charging in recklessly. Goosebumps erupt on the back of her neck as they hear someone clapping. The stage's curtains opened up and they were met with a fragile looking old man with a sadistic grin seemingly etched permanently on mouth. Hello. Glad you could make it, agents, he laughs, stomping his foot twice on the stage and out comes, and Yang shits you not, a fucking throne rising up for him. He sits down, legs crossed and just as they were about to turn around and make a break for it, the other two, Frank and Tyrion and Buff Psycho were right behind them. They didn't move though, just stood there by the door menacingly, let's see how we're going to do this, since you made it all the way here alive, we'll have to make this into a dramatic show. Buff Psycho and Frank and Tyrion began walking around them, the former on the left and the other right, circling them until the pair were standing in front of the stage. They remained quiet, each of them having varying levels of tightness around their eyes. Yang was pulled back as Uncle Crow stood in front of all of them, hey, white hair, emo, both of you run and hide once I give the signal, alright? Stay out of our way, he whispers, tone heavy, gruff and her friends couldn't even answer back. Weiss looked like she was so close to crying, Blake on the other hand was just a couple of breaths away from hyperventilating. She looks at Yang and she could only give her a grim nod, fists clenching tighter. Alright, we'll play a matchup, the old man says, then began pointing at Glinda and Nora, you two are with going to be with my dearest Tyrion, beat him and I'll give you the black haired boy, with a snap of his finger, a spotlight illuminated Ren's form and Nora grit her teeth tighter, clutching the hammer around her hand. Agent Bran Wen on the other hand, will get the scraggly blondie, if he beats Ace here, that is, the buff psycho pounded his fists together and Crow could only glare at him and the old man. And finally, a beautiful reunion, hello Miss Yao Long, he claps, we've been awaiting your arrival. She musters up all her courage to raise her head up, where's my sister, she asks, with a deadly edge to her tone, gauntlets hissing, shoulder tensed and ready to explode at anyone in a moment's notice. Oh don't you worry, she's right here, 
he crossed his legs the other way before snapping his finger again. In the darkened ceiling, a figure emerges. Leaping off the catwalk above and landing on the stage with a graceful flip. Back face to them. Wearing the same black fatigues the other controlled people wore only this one didn't have the stupid cowl that covered everything but their eyes. This one had a tattered looking scarf around her neck, red like blood. When she turned around, all of Yang's bravado dropped, it didn't feel like a reality, she thought when John and Ren had warned them earlier about how Ruby was taken, she was just going to be imprisoned. She was too optimistic. Deep down she knew they had Ruby, the same way they had the others. Neon green eyes stared back at her lifelessly, standing upright. No traces of emotion on that face. I can you're conflicted, Miss Yao Long, not to worry, you'll be together soon. Ruby, she tried calling out, it's me, your big sister, but the girl offered no other movement, not a sliver of acknowledgement. Yang bit her lip until she could taste the metallic tang on her tongue, taking a deep breath and forcing herself not to cry at the moment, I'm sorry about this but... I'll bring you back home, I promise, gauntlets hissing, she raises her arms up in a southpaw stance, I'll bring you back. MMHHM, how touching. But let's get to the main event, Ace, Tyrion, Agent Rose, no, Crimson. Agent Crimson. Be sweet dears and subdue them. She vaguely hears Uncle Crow yell, telling Blake and Weiss to leave but her eyes are focused on Ruby who was calmly walking towards her, unlike the pair of monsters who were already running for Nora, Glinda, and her old man. The two of them were instead caught in a face-off. Truth be told, she'd always been sure if there was a time they'd ever have to fight against each other, in terms of physical strength she'd win, but, this Ruby wasn't, she wasn't her Ruby. This one had the same deadly stance she used when she fought enemies. The one that showed no mercy, letting her bullets fly straight into the skulls of her opponents, and right now, to Ruby. Yang was the enemy. Despite all her talk, she honestly didn't know if she could fight her little sister full out. She didn't have time to figure it out though, because in the split second, Ruby sprinted, a dagger on her left and pistol on her right aiming straight for Yang's face. Wei stared in horror as the fight broke out amongst the two forces. From one side, the mother-daughter duo fought the giant deformity. Nora swinging her lightning hammer, electricity cackling on the heavy end, Glinda providing backup by shooting the big monster but it didn't seem like it was even working. The bullets digging through its skin remained ignored as he focused all his attention on the younger girl. To be rightfully honest, if she wasn't scared shitless right now, she'd be in utter awe about how well Nora was doing. She swung that giant hammer almost as fast as Tyrion punched. Both their hits were so strong you could practically feel it in the air. The peach-haired girl even managed to get a lot of good hits in. From what Weiss could see, the only thing Tyrion had was his size and strength, no single inkling of intelligence in that probably mutated mind of his, just a mindless puppet performing as designed. To be a killing machine. In comparison to Nora who moved quickly, with fine-tuned instincts, she parried his punches with her hammer and retaliated with excellent strikes of electricity. The way her eyes were shining with deadly intent, Weiss could see that despite this big guy being terrifying, nothing was scarier than a Nora whose Ren got hurt. In contrast to Glinda and Nora's performance, Yang and Crow weren't doing as well. Crow was having a difficult time facing the guy who was practically on hypersteroids, or a drug ache into it. Unlike Tyrion, this ace knew how to fight just as effectively, matching Crow's every move. Only Crow didn't have the advantage of bulging muscles on his side. It was almost like a violent dance, Crow jumping and performing a kick, only to be met with a similar kick aimed at his chest, which he would then dodge retaliating with gunshots for the other man to evade as well. A perfect stalemate. The only deciding factor was whoever was going to tire out first. Something told Weiss it'd be Crow rather than the steroid junkie. The one who seemed to have the worst time amongst this intervention was Yang and she could understand why. Ruby, or rather, the controlled one wasn't making it easy on Yang at all. The older sister couldn't rightfully fight back in full strength because no matter what she did, that body was still Ruby's. Every strike of her dagger was met with a near dodge from the blonde fighter, she could feel her veins thrumming every time the Ruby knockoff shot her pistol, aiming directly for Yang's face but the blonde would be able to evade it in the nick of time but not without any damages, Yang was already accumulating more and more wounds. From small cuts to bigger gashes. Blake pulls her down as a bullet sails over their heads, Shni. Do you have a death wish, the black-haired girl cried with exasperation. Currently they were hiding behind a giant crate, 
her brain going on overtime just to think of a way to help them. Her hands immediately sat on the rifle that was slung across her neck and the bombs in her pockets. I have an idea, she whispers and Blake's eyes immediately land on her hands that were gripping the M16. You want to commit murder now, is that it? Blake hisses and Weiss shook her head profusely. No, look, the old man's not really doing anything, he's just sitting there grinning like a madman, ordering Ruby and his toys. If we can threaten him to make them stop attacking, gain the upper hand. They both shared a look, hers was of determination but Blake's was nothing but hesitance. They both peered out above the crate and briefly saw Crow being held up high by Ace only to be thrown horizontally towards a wall. They wince as he landed with a loud slam after but didn't see what happened on the account that they had to once again hide because bullets were flying all over the place. I can't believe we're about to threaten an old man, Blake says, biting her lip and Weiss just rolls her eyes, grabs Blake's head and pulls it upwards to stare at the scene in front of her. An old man who made that monster and took Ruby from us. If anything, he's lucky he's only getting threatened, that fucker, she hisses. The outburst clearly shocking the black-haired girl cause she offered no other protests at that point. Hand immediately grabbing Blake's, they ran, sprinting, keeping themselves on the sides, hiding away from the main fight and making their way to the stage where the senile psycho sat. She held the M16 tightly, eyes carefully trained on the scope. Blake was no different. Albeit reluctant, she had her hand trained on the gun, eyes on the scope and beside her, the black-haired girl had one hand around the wake Hisashi and another on the submachine gun. It didn't take long for them to reach the stage from the sides. Aiming the gun at the old man, they inched closer and closer, order them to stop or we'll shoot, her voice never wavering unlike her hands and legs which were trembling as of the moment. He just shook his head and offered a couple of tuts. Standing up, he faced them. Losing the smile on his face, ah, a shame, he sighs. I was willingly letting you run around cause you were inconsequential in the grand scheme of things, just a couple of girls who don't understand what the real world really was, he began taking off his coat and tossing it in their direction, as she stares at the article of clothing, one thing caught her attention. She sees a small circular pin on the collar of the man's lab coat, purple on the outside with a picture of a syringe filled with the green liquid. Do you know who I am? He starts, removing his unkempt button up, I am a creator. I create things far beyond your understanding, as his shirt drops, within his thin, bony frame was a line of metal, multiple cylinders attached to all his limbs with the same liquid ace had shot in his veins, Tyrion was merely a little test now. Years of trials, study, and the ultimate cultivation. I am the drug czar of the new world and you will all bow down before me. The cylinders of liquid immediately started draining into his veins, pure chemicals flooding his bloodstream. Her hands were shaking as his thin, wiry body started writhing. Muscles getting larger and larger until he was almost as large and disfigured as Tyrion. I saved the best for last. His voice sounded like he was mangled, his manic grin much more pronounced than it was earlier, mouth dripping with so much drool that he looked like a rabid wild dog. Hell even rabid, wild, rabies laden dogs looked more normal than this guy. I'll give you a head start. Run girlies. Run. Men Ruby. Snap out of it. Yang yells just as she was about to dodge another hit from Ruby's dagger. From peripherals she sees Nora, Glinda, and Crow, the last being thrown around like a rag doll. She wasn't doing so hot either. Every slice from the dagger on Ruby's hand had the potential to slash her face in half, with the other gun shooting bullets at her, point-blank range, she was lucky her suit was bulletproof and the gauntlets in her arms deflected them or she would have been Swiss cheese. Slice, slice, shoot, slice. The rhythm of her attacks was practically non-existent. With no limit on her bloodlust and killing intent, this controlled Ruby was more deadly than her sister ever was. Dude. Fight it. Come on. I know you're in there, she called again, trying to punch the dagger away from her hand but she just dodged as if she knew what Yang was going to do. Tsk. Troublesome. Seems like mind-controlled Ruby wasn't as mindless as the other two beasts rampaging around. Of course she wouldn't be, controlled or not, this was Ruby, her genius sister and she really didn't want to have it come down to this, she might have to break a couple of bones in the process. She was going to apologize later, right now, Rubes is gonna be thankful she shattered a couple of ribs in the process. It was when Ruby made a turn and her eyes caught a glimpse of a device fitted on the back of the girl's neck. A circular disc with the same shade of green light erupting from it like her sister's current neon eyeballs. 
So that's the trick, huh? She gritted her teeth. That thing looked like it was practically spliced on Ruby's neck, something that was probably very unpleasant to go through, sorry about this Rubes, you're gonna have to lose that collar now. She charged up her gauntlets, feeling it hissing and then she made her counterattack. If that thing was what's causing her sister to act like this, then she'd have to destroy it. A flurry of jabs was directed straight at her sister, the sounds of clanging from both their weapons colliding with each other but the final one before another horror emerged had her staring eye to eye with Ruby's empty neon ones. Dagger tried so desperately to slice through her metal arm but Yang wouldn't let it. Then from behind Ruby, she saw the psycho old man shedding his coat and injecting a bunch of the same shit the guy that wasn't Tyrion injected. Only this one was tenfold, and just a few feet away were Blake and Weiss. Her body moved fluidly, sliding off her sister's dagger upwards, a loud clang echoed as the dagger sailed away and with a fully powered gauntlet, she shot her right arm forward and punched Ruby in the stomach so hard she flew slammed on the bottom of the stage walls. She sees Ruby slump over, her pistol falling on her side and she prays to every deity she was just unconscious. They were running out of time. She needed to be the one to come up with ideas. Glinda. Do you have a trank? She screams as the older woman backflips out of the way from one of Tyrion's arms. I do. Why? Help Crow. Trank that ace guy. Me and Norrell blow this one's brains off, with a swift nod, Glinda sprints away from Tyrion. The beast tried to catch up to her but Nora's attacks were getting more and more relentless, he knew he couldn't afford to leave the peach-haired girl, one wrong move and he's dead. Well he's dead either way, cause she was so pissed off. Pissed off at them hurting everyone she cares about. Pissed at them for taking her sister and friends. Pissed at them cause they think their fucking league can own the fucking world. Nora. Two-man battle formation. One shot KOs ago, she screams and she briefly catches the peach hair grin maniacally as she leaps out of the Tyrion's near grasp. Her hammer generating enough electricity to match a fucking lightning strike. It was a two-man thing cause so far she knew the only people who could pull this off was them. If the enemy had buff psychos, it was time to match it with their own version of it. Nora. Get ready. I'm throwing him back to you. Gauntlet's fully charged, she knew she only needed to hit Tyrion twice. She ducked just as he was about to grab her with his thick arms, gaining momentum, she punched her left arm into an uppercut that landed cleanly on Tyrion's chin, the monster thrown up with such force he gained was in the air for about 7 meters or so. But she wasn't done, she smirked as her right hand readied itself for the two-parter, just as he was about to land on the floor, she let her fist fly into a straight hook, stronger than her previous punch. How did she know it was stronger? The damage from Ruby's previous onslaught, along with all those previous missions damages finally gave way. This was her last shot of using this metal arm and after it, it was gone. With the last bits of strength had to offer, she punched Tyrion in the chest so hard she felt it crack bones, throwing him straight sideways, finished off by Nora who swung her lightning hammer at just the right moment, landing straight into the top of Tyrion's head. Blood, organs, and brain gunk exploded upon contact with Nora's hammer and she would have cheered a bit more had she not just realized that the Merlot guy had turned into a monster, not only that, she just had one usable gauntlet and Nora's hammer was out of charge. From the other side of the room, she briefly sees Crow and Glinda, fighting against the ace guy in perfect sync and simultaneously embedding a tranquilizer on the enemy's neck. It didn't take long for him to fall down. Monster Merlot was just about to move after her two best friends when his fleshy form started writhing again. Something he didn't expect to happen by the looks of his already mangled face. They could only stare in horror as the muscles beneath his engorged frame started violently thrashing like a separate wild entity. He used too much of his ultra chemical and it was disintegrating from the inside. She snapped out of the trance and her feet immediately sprinted, jumping onto the stage and standing in front of Blake and Weiss. With one good gauntlet and the other bare arm guarding the girls, she was readying herself to fight harder than she did with Ruby and Tyrion and the whole thing felt so slow. Especially when a gunshot rang out and nobody knew who had shot it. From in front of them, they see a bullet fly through Merlot's for it. She briefly sees Nora, Glinda, and Uncle Crow, mouths wide open a look of pure surprise on their faces and the writhing form of Merlot turned around, Yang, Weiss and Blake saw Ruby clutching two pistols on her hands. Her hair was covering her face so they couldn't see her eyes but as soon as she looked up they could see silver. Vibrant, burning rage practically engraved in her face. What she did next was nothing short of horror. She sprinted straight for Merlot but instead of immediately engaging, 
she stepped on his bent knees and used it as leverage, jumping to meet the hulking man at eye level before wrapping her legs around his neck and shoving the two pistols inside his mouth. Yang watched in trepidation as Ruby fired bullet after bullet inside his mouth, some of them piercing through the top of his skull, the others passing through the back of neck. Blood splattering everywhere as the repeated ringing of guns exploding rang around the dome. She held Weiss and Blake tightly, covering them so they wouldn't see her sister's descent into utter outrage. And when the body finally toppled over with a thud and splat, Ruby decided she wasn't done yet. Yang had closed her eyes not wanting to see the sounds of flesh being beaten to a literal pulp as her sister hit the dead man's face with the tip of the gun's grip, repeatedly bashing in his skull. But it still wasn't enough, the silver-eyed girl threw the bloodied guns away, gritting her teeth so hard it was starting to hurt and clenching her fists so tight, they were turning white. Repeated sounds of fists hitting a bloodied head echoed in the room as all of them watched Ruby's anger. Twenty, or thirty punches later, Uncle Crow walked up to her sister and held her fist back just as she was about to make an even bloodier mess. Crow looked at Ruby sadly but when the girl looked up, covered in red liquid, tears streaming down her face, their old man could only hug her tight as Ruby sobbed. Like a permanent piece of her humanity was taken away from her at that moment. It hurts, Uncle Crow. It hurts so much. It hurts, she kept mumbling over and over again, like a broken radio. Broken in more ways than one. For a good moment they all just stood there trying to digest everything that happened. But no matter what they did, they were all stuck. With horrors of what they just witnessed and what they've done. It was a silent affair, they waited for John and Ren to wake up with no one saying anyone until then. Luckily for them, both boys were, well, relatively unharmed. Just a couple of broken bones, bruises, and wounds. Things that easily healed over. As they stared at the carnage they've left in the dome, they were just about to leave and find something that would take them out of there when Ruby pulled away from the rest of the group and began pulling at Ace, trying desperately to drag him with them. Not an easy feat to accomplish in Ruby's current condition in all honesty. Ruby, he's the enemy, leave him here, we'll bomb the place so it'll never be used for something this evil ever again, Crow says but her sister shook her head. No. Crow, please, trust me, please, their old man couldn't say no not when those now dulled silver eyes begged. They ended up lugging the tranquilized pawn with them until they managed to reach the main control room. Apparently, there was an option to have this entire dome raised above sea level and once Glinda had used it, they just had to wait until they were elevated above. As soon as they got up, they were met with stormy skies and raging seas, the earpiece in her ear blared. R.A. Yang, Nora. Penny's voice erupted from the communications channel and with everything that happened, she almost forgot the peach-haired girl was waiting for them. We're here Penny, sorry for the delay, she replied tiredly. You guys just disappeared and I couldn't contact you anymore. It was like the signal was being jammed. Is everyone okay? Must be because of the power outage, anyway, everyone's okay for the most part, so please, could you pick us up? Affirmative, stand by, I'm on my way. True to her word, Penny didn't take that long to arrive. She hovered the jet and soon all of them were flying away, the last thing she saw was flames erupting from the ocean as Uncle Crow pressed the jet's missiles, aiming straight for the dome. Everyone was silent as the ride continued, they didn't know where they were going to go so they had to wait for Crow and Glinda to issue instructions but before that, Crow had asked Ruby one big question. Kiddo, why'd you ask to bring one of their pawns with us? Crow questioned and Ruby just closed her eyes. Check his prints from the WPO database, you'll understand she mumbled, before drifting off into sleep. Not wanting to bother the already tired and traumatized girl, they did as told. First removing the mask that covered this man's head. As soon as they did, shaggy, long golden locks scattered around his face, accompanied by a long, unkempt beard. Something in her began to realize. As Crow removed the gloves from his hands, Glinda placed the man's fingertips on the scanner. The moment it finished scanning, the pure shock on Glinda's face was accompanied by confusion and very audible gasp. On the screen it showed one profile, of a smiling man with sandy blonde hair and a goofy smile. It was their dad. Taeyang Xiaolong. Alright, that's where we'll leave off for the day. Thanks so much for listening along with me today. If you enjoyed please like and comment down below. It really helps with the algorithms. I look forward to seeing you next time. Ciao for now, lovelies.